Uh, well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Friday seminar. Um, our speaker is Ken Giller, who um, is Emeritus Professor of Plant Production Systems at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Um, Ken is he's now Dutch, um, one of the benefits of Brexit that Holland have got him, but he um, did his BSc and PhD at Sheffield, and in fact, he was an ecologist to start with, and his study site for his ecology was Catfield Fen here in Norfolk. And Ken discovered the largest known population of the Fen orchid. And he took a nostalgic visit to Catfield Fen this week to go and see the orchids. So welcome back to Norfolk. Um, Ken, uh, after his PhD, he went to Rothamsted working on nitrogen fixation. And he split his time between Rothamsted, Columbia, and India, where I first met Ken 41 years ago when he was a postdoc at ICRISAT, the International Center for Agricultural Research in the Semi-Arid Tropics, and I was working for a crazy Jesuit social worker, um, but I don't need to say anything about that. He came back to Britain and um, joined the staff at the old Y College in Kent, now part of Imperial College, and became... Hmm? Now, closed. now closed, yes indeed and um, became a professor there, and then moved to Zimbabwe um, for three years as professor of soil science at the University of Zimbabwe. And when the Zimbabwean economy started to collapse, nothing to do with Ken, he moved to Wageningen, where he's been since 2001. Ken is uh, internationally known and um, very widely recognized for his research on smallholder agriculture focusing in particular on soil fertility and the role of nitrogen fixation in tropical legumes. And this is clearly highly relevant to the direction that the John Innes and the um, Norwich uh, Institute of Sustainable Development are going um, with their focus on uh, legumes, especially tropical legumes. Um, Ken is also amongst the many things, uh, many honors that he has and many responsible positions that he has, I'll simply mention that he's co-chair of the United Nations Network on Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems, which I think shows the extent of the recognition that he has in his field. Um, and he's going to uh, teach us today about, uh, talk to us today about land sparing and land sharing. And so um, welcome to the John Innes, and we look forward to your seminar. <clears throat> Well, <clears throat> yeah, thanks very much indeed, James. And, and you know, what an honor to speak to you on the occasion of this, to honor the contribution of Professor Roland Biffen. Uh, first confession, of course, is, is and I, it's already been made for me, but I started off my PhD research in this beautiful area in Catfield Fen. I didn't take those pictures this week. And it was all about this scrotty little yellow plant called the fen orchid, which is one of the rarest plants in the UK. So that was where I started off, working from the University of Sheffield. But in the week of my, just before I retired last year, I had the honor of giving a talk at the opening of the academic year at Wageningen University, a very grand occasion. You can see all those professors dressed up like, like uh, church ministers or something. And um, I was asked to speak about land sharing or land sparing. And I said immediately, but that's nonsense. One of those simple dichotomies, we should be talking about land sharing and land sparing. And it led me actually to, to develop a, a talk around a, a range of different work that we've done. And, and what I'm doing today is basically developing that talk quite a bit further. Um, so I'll start off talking then about some of the challenges today. I'll, I'll talk about this idea of simple dichotomies I'll talk about the idea of alternative agricultures, of, of regenerative agriculture, agroecology, and I'll finish with some thoughts about science at a crossroads. So I work in Africa, and if we think about what we're facing over the next 20 years or so, we're going to have an extra billion people on the planet by 2050. We're, in Europe and many parts of the world, we're worried about the aging population. The population in China is now going down. In Europe, we're faced with this increasing retirement age. We don't retire at 65 anymore. I retired at 66 and 10 months. The Dutch are fairly accurate on this. And at that point, I had to retire. In future, people will be older when they retire. We're worried about that. But 
In Africa, we're facing very rapid population growth, which by the end of the century could be as many as 4 billion people if things don't slow down. And certainly by 2050, there'll be uh, plenty more. And this, of course, is in the face of climate change. We, we saw this last year. We topped the 1.5 degrees already, I think. It's, and we're, we're at the same time, we've got commitments to put a third of the planet aside for biodiversity. So I think those three things together really illustrate the, the problem that we're facing. And this graph shows basically what has happened with crop yields since 1960, starting down here. And you can see crop yields in many parts of the world have gone up enormously. In Europe, crop yields have gone up, uh, and in the US, uh, by what, 250, 350%. We've actually decreased the area harvested. We've set aside land. Land which was unproductive has gone out of agriculture. In Asia, we've seen, of course, the, the Green Revolution, but not much expansion of agriculture in Brazil. We all know about Brazil, but massive improvements in productivity and, and big concerns for land use change. But in Africa, the increases in yields have been very marginal. And the population that has grown and it's expanded enormously has been fed essentially by the expansion of agriculture. So land is absolutely at a premium for the future. So this is then a real challenge, but it's also an opportunity because, of course, if yields are so low, they can be increased. So that can be a, a real opportunity for smallholder farmers to meet this urgent need for increase in production. But today I decided then to talk about this land sparing versus land sharing. These are really put up as two, two opposites. The idea of the Borlaug hypothesis, we can increase yields by concentrating on small areas to maximize yield, then we can set aside areas for conservation. The opposite is land sharing, where we mix small patches of natural habitat with production in what we call wildlife friendly farming. And we also look at increasing biodiversity with low input agriculture on plots. And these really are, are presented then, I think, in, in very simplistic arguments. So should we integrate, should we segregate agriculture and nature? And we live at a time then when, when populist politics prevail. Depressing news from America this morning about the latest primaries. When people are focused very much on short-term political and economic goals and when basically I think nature and the, the planet is being sacrificed for, for economic goals. And at a time when science is actually continually under threat, when people don't think that facts matter anymore, we're told this by government, they're no longer looking, if you like, for evidence-based decision-making and evidence-based policy. So how should we respond as a community? And I think this is why I choose this. You know, we're drawn into these rather seductively simple, but rather puerile, if you like, false dichotomies. It's black or it's white. We're asked to say, which side of the fence are we on as scientists? When our job, of course, is to engage in complexity and try and understand the nuance of what needs to fit in different places. And I think that this is a, a discussion which needs to be framed according to the local context. I don't think it's black and white at all. I think we need to look at all the various shades of gray, or should I say the various shades of green, for what purposes and for what types of biodiversity do we want to put land aside? So should we segregate, should we integrate? And I want to share with you a few examples. And the first one is one which concerns us all, because we all love chocolate, of course. And chocolate is produced by smallholder farmers, mainly in West Africa, more than 60% uh, of the production globally, many of whom are actually very poor. But the consumption, of course, is, is found in much more in, in uh, Northern Europe, in North America. So it's one of those crops which provides a very sharp contrast, if you like, between the consumption side and the production side. And working with colleagues from the World Conservation Monitoring Center, we were looking then at the biodiversity of different uh, cocoa production systems. And this is one where we can really talk about the integration of a crop 
within the forest. Yeah, this is essentially here we've got a tall rainforest which has been thinned, but with cocoa growing as an understory. So if we look at the biodiversity in terms of species richness, open cropland here being very poor relative to the rainforest, cocoa plantations in between, but we've got different types of cocoa forests. We've got this natural shade agroforest, you've got planted shade agroforestry, or we have monoculture. And monoculture, this is in Cameroon, in fact, I took these pictures. This is what monoculture cocoa looks like. Fairly impressive tree there with a farmer walking in between. And working on with a whole series of companies then, developing these sustainability assessment tools. Don't worry, I won't go through all the details but trying to give guidance on how to support the development of cocoa so that we can look at what parts of nature can we preserve. And I want to zoom in just in this part of this decision tree because we've got this, this, this difference here between cocoa growing under thin forest, which is not so good for cocoa production, very good for carbon, good for decreased emissions, good for biodiversity, pretty good for climate adaptation and some ecosystem, some income diversification. But on the other side, we've got the more or less open cocoa production, which is very good for production. Uh, it's not so good for the other ecosystem services. And we took, actually, with a colleague, Marika Saxon, working with workshops with farmers, took them from different production areas to see the other areas. And we found that farmers from the monoculture cocoa, they liked this very much because of the diversity, but they were not so willing to sacrifice the income. Farmers from here were actually rather enamored with the increase in income. But of course, they, they recognized that they had many other benefits. But if we're going to try and preserve cocoa in this sort of landscape, we're going to have to think about payments for environmental services to reward farmers, basically for giving up the extra income. But I think it's a nice example where if we want to design landscapes in Cameroon, then this type of cocoa production can be extremely useful to provide connectivity between remaining parts of the landscape. That's an example where we can argue that biodiversity and a crop can mix rather well. But I want to move on to an example from Zimbabwe where the mixture of the biodiversity and uh, people is not so great. So this is an area some of you might know in the mid Zambezi Valley of Manapools. And here we have the biodiversity, the slides of, of my colleague Fred Baudron. So lots of wildlife, the emblematic megafauna. But in this same landscape, we have an area of communal land here where many people live. They benefit from wildlife. This is actually a, an elephant that was a, a trophy hunted elephant where people are sharing the meat. They have other benefits of wildlife, but they're also faced with wildlife in their fields. And we were fortunate with to be able to do a study back in 2007 where we were looking at the production of cotton. And cotton was raising income so people could buy more livestock which allowed them to clear land. And of course they were clearing land directly for the cotton. So essentially what was happening was that cotton was driving land use change. But with the economic collapse in Zimbabwe you can see that cotton essentially disappeared. This is one of these sort of real life experiments, if you like, and what happens when there's massive change in the field. And together with Fred Baudron, who did his PhD uh, in the early, in the middle of the, 2007, and so we did a follow up then where we did a same survey with all the same farmers, but 10 years, 12 years later. And what we found had switched was that cotton had actually gone down. There was much less area of cotton at the, as a main source of income. It had declined enormously. But what had happened in its stead was that people had switched over to extensive livestock, essentially because they couldn't earn money from cotton anymore. They didn't have the cash crop. And livestock then are not so labor intensive. Now, what did that result in? Here we've got aerial census data from 2003 and 2014. These are done by the, uh, the Wildlife Trust. So we don't have data for every year, but you can see there's been a massive decline 
in the populations of elephants, of buffalo, zebra, uh, kudu, all the small antelopes, warthog. I mean, a massive loss, basically, because all of the habitat which was then shared by the wildlife has disappeared. That means as well that the local revenues from wildlife, this was an area where trophy hunting went on, where the local people benefited a lot from the hunting fees which were shared with the local communities. It's one of the earliest community-based natural resource management programs in the world, the campfire program. And you can see that the incomes here from trophy hunting have gone down enormously. But at the same time, the costs of living with wildlife remain very high. You'll recognize some of these animals, but on average in this area, wildlife kill four people, they injure about 11, they kill 68 heads of cattle, 166 small ruminants, they destroy granaries, and they destroy large areas of crops. And I think it's another example where if we want to preserve this wildlife, we as a global community need to really start to share some of the costs. Now, if we look at, this is a paper we published actually in 2014 together with Fred, Fred Baudron. We called it Agriculture and Nature, Trouble and Strife. Those of you who know a bit of Cockney rhyming slang would know that trouble and, slife, trouble and strife means your wife. So, uh, sorry about that, but anyway. Uh, but it's about the, the joys and the problems of coexistence. But developing countries, they have the most biodiversity rich areas on the planet. Most of the biodiversity is not in the parks. It's actually in production landscapes outside parks. But all of these global conservation agencies, they promote the wilderness approach, the idea of natu natural parks. But then at the same time, they all support low input extensive farming. And low input extensive farming takes up a lot of land. So there's a real dilemma here which basically means why why are these organizations in all of their publicity promoting low input extensive agriculture if they want to be able to put land aside in parks for nature and in fact it's not quite true because many of these not all of them but certainly tnc and wodf are very very active in actually looking at intensifying agriculture together with smallholders but they don't put that on their websites because it doesn't attract so much funding, uh, for much funding. But this leads me on to this idea of then of what I call the framing of farming. And I've worked together with a colleague, a past colleague of yours uh, here at the university very much with Jim Sunberg on this, thinking about the whole idea of how do we think about framing farming. And what we're faced with is this idea of, of regenerative, of organic, agroecological, traditional, indigenous, alternative, family farming. These are all words which, we, which warm our souls, yeah? which we make us feel good when we're talking about farming. And what we tend to do is we, we juxtapose that against industrial, large-scale, conventional farming. But we asked this question in a paper we published in 2022, what is conventional agriculture? Actually, conventional agriculture is 99% of the world's agriculture. It's used, though, as a pillory to create an alternative which is used very, very much in discussion and debates. But almost all farms in the world are essentially conventional family farms. And I want to carry on now and, and to discuss some of, of these debates that go on around agriculture, because I think this really drives very much to the core of the problems that we face, particularly in public discussions around uh, around uh, agriculture so we're faced with these platitudes i think the food system's broken yeah agriculture in crisis collapse of soil health biodiversity facing a six mass extinction crop yields are plateauing of course all in the face of climate change and what's the answer well, here we are, the World Economic Forum is saying the food system's broken. There's three ways we're going to fix it. And then we've got science academies also joining in. The food system's broken. This is from uh, 2018 in The Guardian. And of course, it's in The Guardian. I believe it because I, I I'd hear very, very much support The Guardian, one of the very, very few independent world uh, uh, news resources in the world. 
So we wrote this paper in 2021, um, Regenerative Agriculture, looking at it from the perspective of agriculture. And we had an amazing, this, this little circle-y thing here, actually is an altmetric score. It was a, a paper that, of all the papers I've published, in a fairly obscure outlet, Outlook on Agriculture. Its impact factor was less than one, actually. We've raised that to above three already, and it's on its way up. But it's a great source where you can actually have a good discussion. But we, we wrote this paper because I, I was actually at a, a meeting of Unilever's Sustainable Sourcing Advisory Board, and everybody started talking about regenerative agriculture, and I had no idea what it was. This is in 2019. So I went away, and we started doing some work to look at it. And we found then, this is using the Nexus database, number of news items per year, it really took off in 2016 across the world. And it gained popularity with all the NGOs, the big uh, NGOs, including Friends of the Earth, multinationals, Danone, Olam, General Mills, I'll come back to this, the World Council for Sustainable Business Development, with charitable foundations through Rockefeller, Ikea, who've got big programs promoting regenerative in Africa now. And of course, with farmers, but particularly livestock farmers in, in the US and the Antipodes. So here we are, the Nature Conservancy. The next revolution is underneath our feet. We've got here a Greenpeace film on the regenerators. Then we've got Nestle supporting regenerative agriculture, General Mills, we've got Danone, the Unilever 13 regenerative agriculture principles in 2021, Patagonia, regenerative organic agriculture for all their clothing, trading companies, Olam and others, putting regenerative approaches in their supply chains. PepsiCo came on board, investing $3 billion in regenerative agriculture. And then last year, Guinness, embarking on regenerative agriculture as good things are taking root. Here we've got our Guinness in the soil. And in the Financial Times, you won't be able to read the date probably, it's January 25th, just a week or so ago, I actually quoted in the Financial Times, they wanted to interview me as the investment potential for regenerative agriculture, a lot of venture capital coming in. In Europe, the Science Advisory Capital uh, Council, sorry, the Farm to Fork strategy and biodiversity strategies all around regenerative agriculture. But what is it? So we find the origins actually go back to 19, early 1980s, 1983, from Robert Rodale, who is the head of the Rodale Institute in the United States, which is basically the Organic Agriculture Institute for, uh, Research Institute for the US. And these keywords here are increasing land, biological production base, no impact on the environment, foodstuffs free of biocides, minimal reliance on non-reviewable resources. So really looking very much at what Dick Harwood said, high degree of self-reliance, uh, what we call these days circular agriculture. And then 2019 already, Diana Martin from Rodale was really worried because they were losing the plot their regenerative agriculture was being taken over as a new buzzword and becoming greenwashed. So in our review, we looked at, well, what were the principles and practices? So principles over here, so minimizing tillage, maintaining soil cover, building soil carbon, sequestering carbon, relying on biological nutrients uh, cycles, uh, fostering diversity, integrating livestock, avoiding pesticides, and encouraging water percolation. So a lot of what are really basic agronomic practices. And then these are, these are, sorry, principles. These are translated into these practices, some of which are very clear, you know, conservation, agriculture, zero till. But we start to get some which are a bit fringe, I'd call them. You know, permaculture does fit in some places, but things like compost tea, I really have little faith in, to be honest. And it's a really a, a, a mash-mash of everything, including uh, Ted Savory's uh, The Holistic Grazing, which is also something which has very, very little basis in science. But this amazing interest in soil, soil health, being so prominent, and yeah, some bit of lip service, really, to biodiversity. 
And then we get organizations like this, the Carbon Underground. This is from their website. I mean, what a, a soup of logos. And here in the middle, Kiss the Ground. I don't know how many people saw this film on Netflix. It's a fairly nauseating uh, documentary. Um, but it all focuses in on soil. So just to go into Kiss the Ground, this is from their website. Building healthy soil solves everything. Yeah, I mean, I could stop the talk here at this point, I think, and leave the room. It just solves everything. We've got this difference between healthy soil and dead soil. Increased carbon, water holding capacity, aggregation, soil life, nutrient availability. It's a solution to climate change. This is from a, a California State University, Chico. And I've met uh, the main person behind this and been in discussions with him. The future of agriculture, regenerative agriculture. Dr. David Johnson, his research on fungal dominated compost. It can store 20 to 50 times the currently observed soil carbon. I don't know if you're starting to doubt things yet. You do that with this bioreactor where you make this fungal based compost and you spread it on the fields at a rate of around three kilos per hectare. It's not possible. We've got here Dr. Elaine, Dr. Elaine Sood soil food web approach, the essence of soil regeneration. We have 150% increase in soil production with 100% reduction in chemical inputs and 50% reduction in your irrigation needs. You want to know how to do it? I'll just sign up, it's only $5,000 for the course. I'm not putting this forward as a recommendation. FAO came out with 12 children's stories on the magical world of soil biodiversity. It's all framed around this idea of soil solving everything. And then all of a sudden, things popping up. Is overselling the climate benefits undercutting its potential? A report came out from Rodale, which basically said, if we introduce regenerative agriculture everywhere we could store enough carbon in the soil you didn't need to worry about anything else in climate change and of course all the people who invested in electric cars it wasn't necessary you know we didn't need to worry about other things like fossil fuels because you could focus it in the soil but they really oversold the game and nevertheless we have all of these schemes going on how to be a carbon farmer this is in the eu different companies coming up telling us how we can actually earn money by storing carbon in the soil. And together with some young researchers, uh, young scientists in, in Wageningen, we produced this soil last year in uh, global change biology, carbon for soils. We know that carbon is very important for soil productivity, for soil conditions, for soil health, but not soils for storing carbon. And the arguments go that nearly all of these original estimates were based on the idea of a constant rate of, of carbon sequestration. So you measure something, you change your practice, you get a big boost of carbon going into the soil, and they were predicting that that would just continue constantly. And therefore, of course, your soil carbon sequestration just increased enormously. That's the constant rate. If we hadn't have a slow decrease, in the rate of soil carbon accumulation, we come out somewhere over here. If we have a fast decrease, and to be honest, normally when you change practice, you're into a situation where you reach the new equilibrium within five to 10 years, then the potential, if the sequestering rate is going down this fast, then the potential for carbon storage is much, much less. So basically the numbers don't add up. Further, we're told that we should store carbon because it increases crop yields. But Renske Habeck, in her work, Renske did a, a meta-analysis of all the long-term trials she could find. Don't worry about all the details, but if you correct for the fact that usually when you're adding carbon, you're adding more fertilizer and other nutrients as well, then the ones in red are decreases in soil carbon. The uh, orange, if I can't, yellow color is basically where there was no change, and the blue are situations where you had a positive benefit in terms of 
um, sorry, this is the increase in yield with the change in practice, which changed soil carbon. And of course, it's the age old question is, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Establishing causality between things you measure in the field, such as soil carbon and crop yields, is extremely difficult. Nearly every agricultural practice, all of these practices, reducing tillage, cover crops, organic amendments, we're looking at influences on crop yield. If we increase crop yield, does that then increase soil carbon? Many of them at the same time are potentially increasing soil carbon. Is that then increasing yield, which in turn is increasing soil carbon? We don't really know which comes first. So our main points, if you like, of critique of the regenerative agriculture story are, well, first of all, given this huge diversity of agricultural systems across the globe, why don't we take this into account when we're thinking about different starting points? The starting points vary over time and space. But so little attention is given to the starting points and local context. When we're talking about agrochemicals, they bundle everything under one. All agrochemicals have to reduce. When the concerns for human health, basically of fertilizers or pesticides, they differ enormously. And there's very little alternative uh, attention to the alternative methods of pest and disease control. And that's clearly something where John Innes Center and much of the research here needs to contribute in future to us being able to reduce the intensity of pesticide use. And further, they focus very much on the farm without thinking about these spillover effects in terms of ecological footprints and land sparing. So we came up with some guides for engagement uh, on regenerative agriculture. First of all, what's the problem that you want to address? What are you trying to regenerate? What's the mechanism that that's going to help you do it? Can you in in include that mechanism into a practice which could be socially, economically viable within that context? And what would the, the environment, the institutional environment, the political and social forces, which would drive the change? So that's where we, we think, in a sense, you should go if you want to engage in regenerative agriculture. But if I move on then to agroecology, agroecology has 13 principles most of which you can't really disagree with. Uh, recycling, soil health, animal health, biodiversity, but then also things like fairness, equity, participation, co-creation of knowledge. These are all then these principles from the high level panel of experts. And together with Jim Sunberg, we just published this paper at the end of last year, where we see these alternative agricultures, they de define themselves through these principles. In no way do those principles undermine what we call mainstream agronomy. They're basically the principles of good agricultural practice. But in proclaiming these principles, they're essentially looking for legitimacy and trying to claim a place in what we call a rather crowded and contested marketplace when it comes to all of these different players around agriculture. Now, going back to this graph that I showed you at the beginning, it was basically from a paper I did for the UN Food Systems Summit, thinking about who are the farmers of the future, who will produce our food. And here in Africa, this is, if you like, my signature slide taken in Zimbabwe of this soil fertility, a soil which is producing nothing because that soil has been continuously cropped without inputs. And if you want to degrade a soil, continue cropping without putting anything back. And that leads to soil degradation. And I showed you this amazing expansion of agriculture. Well, if we look at nitrogen use across the planet in the same way from 1960 onwards, you can see massive increases in nitrogen use from 1960 onwards. Not so much in Europe and North America, they were already using fertilizer. But in Africa, very little increase. And that graph looks remarkably similar to this, doesn't it? So in a sense, what's driven land expansion in Africa has been the lack of inputs and the lack of ability to increase yields. Now, I'm on dangerous ground here, but I mentioned one example, and this is based on my earlier understanding of what was going on with Phytophthora in, in potatoes. And I made this slide before I went out for dinner last night with, with Jonathan Jones and others, and was, I, I think I've been updated since then. But I think the point remains most of these alternative agricultures eschew the use of any 
genetic manipulation, whether it's gene editing or whatever, it doesn't fit in agroecology. But I see that as using biology, the best of biology, biological resistance to overcome the need for chemicals. We've got this opportunity of st triple stack resistance to late light. There are pro programs in, in the Netherlands using older techniques. And now, of course, you guys can do this much more elegantly. And Jonathan explained some things to me this morning. But how can we convince the public that if we want to reduce pesticides, we need to get these uh, methods out there and used very quickly? Now, another example on the use of reducing inputs is the many inoculants that are around claims of alternative nitrogen fixing bacteria and i know ray dixon's in the audience hi ray uh, you'll probably shoot me after this but i it was a, a workshop in in uh, seattle with the gates foundation last year where bill has heard about these inoculants and he said we should be investing in this for africa and i'm going please don't because they don't work and I give you one example, and it's the most clear example. And you can see here, this is a meeting between Corteva and somebody called me. Their slide. This is what they claim, that Utricia N, how it works, it enters, enters the plant through the stomata, colonizes the leaf cells, it converts nitrogen into ammonium, a constant supply of nitrogen to the plant. There's no plant energy required for this process. Uh, this is on sale in the United States. It's on sale as Blue N in Europe. And the bacterium that they're using, we work with Julie Ardley, some of you would know from Murdoch University. But it's a Methylobacter, um, Methylobacterium symbioticum. And it doesn't contain nitrogenase. Now that's the clearest example that I could go out very public and say, sorry, this is a fraud. And when are you going to take the product off the market? And we published that in a, it's in a Dutch magazine. This is an English translation that's out there on the internet. And they, were, they, they get a bit worried, but they haven't come back to me yet and told me when they're going to take it off the market. But what's driving this is all of this populist nonsense that's out there without any good science base, I would argue, where people jump on a bandwagon. And I've had many people on Rockefeller Foundation and others saying, yeah, but they've, got, they've raised venture capital of 30 million. There must be something in it. And I'm saying, sorry. That's just people with a lot of money who can, can't make sensible decisions. Anyway, I think overall, regenerative agriculture is here to stay. It's got so much momentum with all of these companies. What's good about it? Well, it's taking the goalposts from what we had as sustainable intensification, which was a do no harm approach. Okay, but let's do agriculture. We want to do better, yeah? Now, there's, we lack a clear definition of regenerative agriculture. I think, actually, that's, a, that's useful for us because it maybe allows for many more diverse things to be done. It's maybe more a help than a hindrance. There's a common set of principles of regenerative agriculture we can identify um, around basic good agronomic practices. But then this huge diversity of farms and farming systems and takeoff points, it means we need this tailored approach. In Europe, in the Netherlands, we've got to reduce our nitrogen inputs. It's desperate in terms of the amount of manure which is being created by soy coming from, uh, from Latin America together with fertilizer. We've got huge problems for nature. But in Africa, we need to increase inputs. It depends on your starting point. And then monitoring and measuring will actually remain a problem, a real challenge. On cocoa, we were actually approached by Nestle to say, we want to do regenerative agriculture in cocoa. How do we do it? And we actually distilled it down to these things. they zero carbon commitment, soil health, and enhancing biodiversity, alongside, of course, their commitments to reducing child labor and giving people a good income. And this report's out there on the internet. I'm the first author of it. It's a prog program we're doing with Nestle because we're actually out there trying to measure what they're doing in a detailed way with greenhouse gas emissions to give them the first baseline, if you like, so that we can then measure whether or not what they do in terms of their change actually leads to the change that they want. Now, going back to my PhD days, 
as I'm retiring, I've picked up the baton again, and I'm working on this area which is very close to Rachning. It's a beautiful area where 400 hectares with crowdsourcing for people like me and others, we've turned poorly productive wet grassland, which was used for extensive livestock, back to nature. Fantastic nature of birds, this uh, gentians, beautiful uh, flowers, and I'm involved in doing the vegetation monitoring and classification. It's wonderful to do. It really gives me huge energy. I love it. It's going back to my hobby. But at the same time, if we're going to have this greener Europe, if we're going to have the Green Deal, if we're going to re reduce production in Africa, what is going to happen in terms of our footprint in the world unless we decrease our consumption at the same time? I think this is a real dilemma. This report is saying the Green Deal, farm to fork, could increase food prices, it could increase insecurity in food, global food security. Particularly in Africa, with their changing diets, the increased reliance on food inputs, it's likely to be affected and it's likely to cause more biodiversity loss in Africa. One more slide before I move to the conclusion. I had this article I wrote actually in, in Geoderma, another one of these mainstream journals, um, which I call Grounding the Helicopters. And it's about helicopter science and helicopter policy, the idea that we're parachuting in from outside these policies into different places. And this is happening very, very much in, in, in Africa. That basically we've got NGOs pushing green agendas in Africa, telling people they've got to reduce their inputs of fertilizer when they're hardly using anything to start off with. And where without inputs, they're degrading their soils. And the idea that as Europe, if you like, our governments should be dictating what people should be doing everywhere. So it's a real strong plea, if you like, for local generation of the priorities in relation to the future for the agriculture in people's countries. So to conclude, I said I'd come back to this idea of science at a crossroads. And I'm particularly enamored by this cartoon that some of you might have seen. Philippe Bave used this in a paper when he was doing a bit of a critique of, uh, of soil health. But here we are as a population in the world. Here we are walking along, we're turning left, just like the lemmings, if you like, falling off the cliff. Look at what's going on in terms of climate change. What are we doing about it? I start to despair. What's happening in Africa in terms of population growth? We're not paying attention to it. What's happening to biodiversity? What's going to be there for the next generation? And at the same time, this was in the, the Observer on Saturday, the Observer Guardian last Saturday, Saturday the 3rd of February. The situation is appalling. Fake scientific papers pushing research for credibility to cri crisis point. 10,000 papers retracted by academic journals. I was at an editor's meeting with Elsevier in a, a week or so ago in Amsterdam. And these paper mills, I'd never heard of them, but they're out there in different countries. They generate papers, but they don't just generate papers that are submitted to journals. They actually establish their own people as guest editors for those journals. And they're then published. And you get the most peculiar things happening. As I got on the plane to come here on Tuesday, I had two invitations. Both of them for June the 12th to 14th, 2024 in Budapest. Interesting. The first was to join the 11th International Congress on Gynecology and Obstetrics to present a paper on the impacts of heterogeneity in soil fertility and legume finger millet productivity. I am an author of this paper, by the way, so it's quite a good paper, but I'm not sure it fits the bill terribly well. <laughs> and here I was being invited to be a chair or speaker at the World Congress of Infectious Diseases, and I can assure you I have no papers whatsoever on infectious diseases. Science is in a really dark place at the moment. So, what do we do about it? Well. The scale of the challenges is absolutely daunting. I want to just draw on some notes just to make sure I, I, I hit all the right buttons here. 
So, first of all, what do we need to do? I'd say we need to move away from these simple dichotomies. Yeah? As scientists, we, we need to get off this sort of bandwagoning. We shouldn't be trying to show that things are right or wrong. We should be trying to engage with the complexity in the world of what works where and how and why and, and, and providing evidence, if you like, where we can think deeply about how our work can contribute to better societal outcomes. And not only that, but who's going to be the winners and who are going to be the losers? Because there are clear trade-offs in all of these things when we talk about land sharing and land sparing. Second then, in this world which is so highly competitive for funding in science, I'd say we increasingly find scientists jumping onto bandwagons and actually overselling their research in a way which I consider to be on the verge of being unethical. So they're often trying to answer questions that are wrongly framed. And to give you an example, in the Netherlands at Wageningen, my two co-authors on that soil carbon paper, colleagues tried to close them down in the discussion because they say, yeah, but you can't, you can't go around saying that because we've got money from the ministry to work on this with farmers to start building soil carbon and selling carbon credits. You say, sorry, uh, academic freedom and all that. And we started an internal debate to try and suppress that as a practice. You know, what should happen if the government comes to you and asks you to work on it? You say, well, that's, that's fine. Yeah, we'll work on that problem. But your question is framed in the wrong way. We need to turn that on its head and develop the evidence to actually address that question properly, not simply to promote something that's not going to work. How do we do this? We need to engage much, much more, of course, in debate. And in that debate, we need to be simple and clear in our communication. We're always told this, you know, ah, people don't read more than a paragraph. We need a policy brief of less than one page. It's nonsense. That paper on regenerative agriculture we produced, I was told by a couple of companies, it was circulated through the boardroom. And of course, it's the advisors of the people making the decisions who actually do a lot of reading in the good ministries, and they spend a lot of time trying to understand what's going on. So we need to, I would argue, get our stuff out there, peer reviewed, published, and then use that for these discussions and debates. So we need to be heard, but we shouldn't be too simplistic. I think we need to be active. We need to get engaged. We need to be heard. But my final point would be, you have to remember that there is no room for dogma in science. That's something that we've got to escape from. You know, as I sort of wind up my career, I can say, you know, what a privilege it's been for, to be able to work as, a, as an educator, to work as a scientist, to do, if you like, things I love all my career. But I think we owe it back to society to actually use the best of our knowledge to actually create this better world. With that, I'd like to thank some colleagues who did all of the work, of course, you know that sort of talk, but particularly these, these names here of people that we've, we've written together very, very much on these issues. And we have a thing called table debates on the Wageningen, uh, Wageningen is one of the contributors with Oxford, the Martin School, and with uh, the Swedish University uh, in Uppsala, basically trying to actually engage in these debates uh, uh, and, and get those discussions out into, into the sphere. And so please read it, contribute, get active. Let's have an evidence-based world and not a populist world. Thank you very much. Ken, I thought you'd address the big questions and you've excelled my expectations considerably. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's particularly appropriate to give the first few questions to students and uh, other younger scientists here, early career scientists. Um, or indeed anyone here. Don't be shy. Don't <clears throat> be shy. And we've also got over 100 people on um, the internet. 150. Um, Ken, by the way, was a pioneer of, of internet conferences, um, using them to connect scientists across sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, let's read this one out first. Um, this is from Mario Kakamo. I agree, regenerative agriculture is here to stay, and that is a good. The adoption of regenerative farming, however, will have an inevitable impact on the quality, if not the uniformity, of the food ingredients. Quality is a key element in food production. An example is protein content in milling wheat, but there are many more. Who will and should pay for the associated costs? Mm. The price of food is always a really, really difficult one. I mean, I think here in Europe, uh, people are complaining very much about the price of food. We, we, we tend to spend, what, 10 to 15 percent of, uh, of our income on food. Many of the communities where I work in Africa, and I mean, most of my work there has been on promoting legumes for nutrition and everything else, spend 50 to 60 percent of their income on food. If food prices go up, the people who really suffer globally, because we have a global system which regulates cereal prices, it tends to be the poor. So at the end of the day, I do believe that we need to pay more for our food, but how we do so in a way which is equitable, I think is an extremely difficult and thorny problem. I don't think I can give you a really straightforward answer on that. Uh, Saskia over there. Uh, thank you for that inspiring talk. Um, I have a question about uh, now a specific example of co uh, cacao. I mean, uh, the farmers in Africa get very little money for their uh, cacao, whereas Nestle is making huge profits. So, I mean, okay, we can pay more for our food, but you know, it sure. is also uh, the responsibility of companies to also manage their profit making. Sure. Right. So, what is how what can be done to to um, uh, manage the middle management of cacao, basically? Yeah. No, another good good question. I mean, in in um, you know, I think cocoa production, particularly for countries like Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, is is incredibly important. The whole economy drives on it. Governments uh, are elected or fall based on the subsidies they give around cocoa production often. And if we look at the price of chocolate, um, I think it, 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 it's, I, I'll probably misquote this, but I think you know, uh, 15 years ago, something like 12 or 15% of the price of a chocolate bar went back to the farm, and now that's down to 8%. So the share that the farmer actually receives of the value of the final product is extremely small. Now, what is going on? I mean, many of the bigger companies, so Nestle doesn't buy cocoa directly, it buys from other traders. So companies like Cargill, they're setting up cocoa liquor factors in the country. So they're looking at ways, if you like, of remitting more of the added value back in country. Um, but I mean, your, your basic point is an extremely valid one. And I think all of us, I mean, I wouldn't mind, I don't eat that much chocolate anyway. But, I wouldn't mind paying more for my chocolate if I knew that that was going to go back actually to the producer at the end of the chain. But generally, you know, farmers globally, if we look at our economic system around food, I think both farmers in Europe and farmers in Africa face the same problem of the margins at the production end are so tight. You know, at one end, our economy is driving expansion and intensification in Europe. At the other end, it's driving expansion of agriculture onto new land at the other end, because the margins are so small, it's hard to do in Africa the intensification. So I mean, I, I would argue, you know, people put a lot of the emphasis back on, um, on the farmers, on the producers, but actually I think it's our global economic system which needs address, and that needs government interference, actually. Um, there's a mass of questions. Oh, let me take the quest more questions to the audience. There's a lady in the green jumper, I think you were first. David is just there in the middle of Hi, uh, thank you. So you talked about the somewhat questionable products and the amount of investment that goes into those. And the kind of flip side of that is that science is chasing money rather than money chasing science. It's all about the flow of funds. How do we start to change that? Or what are your views on how we start to change that? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's going to be a long journey. <laughs> and, and, you know, maybe it's... Uh, it's, it's easy for me to say. Um, but over the past years, you know, I've been involved 
I'm, I'm currently advising the Gatsby Foundation, the Gatsby Africa, uh, on their programs in, in Africa around investment. And with Gatsby Africa together, we're working with the Kenyan government very much on their priorities currently. Um, I think, you know, I, I've been in heavily involved and I had a lot of money actually from the Gates Foundation in Seattle for, for work we've done in Africa. And I think we've managed through our work and through our engagement to change the way they think about what they do. And it, it's a matter of getting engaged and chipping away at it, if you like. I mean, we were discussing this morning with people from the NISD, whatever you call it, how difficult it here is in the UK because there's nobody to talk to anymore. You know, we don't have DFID anymore. We don't have the Department for International Development. So there aren't people there in London or wherever in government that you can really have a sensible conversation with anymore, which is really difficult. And that means as well that so much goes on, if you like, through social media uh, and through, um, through the news, the reliable news. I think we need to be out there being much more engaged and much more vocal to try and influence some of these broader debates, because it's also about trying to change public opinion as well. And in an election year, when I look at what's on offer, I mean, here in the UK, I mean, I, I, it's difficult, you know, but you've got to stay positive somehow. You know, you've got to stay positive. So. It's not easy. Eh? Uh, yeah, um, Jonathan, do you want to? Or Ray? Jonathan? Hand up earlier. Yeah, just a moment, Ray. <coughs> Thanks very much, Ken. Um, one issue that uh, often features in these kind of discussions that you, you haven't brought in that I've been interested in your views on is meat. Uh, so the industrial meat industry, of course, um, is problematic, you know, uh, large-scale de deforestation in, in Latin America for, for soybeans and for uh, cattle. And on the other hand, in Africa, um, meat uh, is, is, and, and animals are part of the economy in a way you wouldn't, you can't take away. So, w what's your two cents on sure. the extent to which the meat industry is part of the problem? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, from yesterday evening when we were there together, I'm, I'm not a vegetarian. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> although we, yeah, at home we we cook meat, yeah, once a week, something like that. I, I do think in, in Europe we we really need to look at our consumption patterns because part of our global footprint is what we eat, of course, and, and, and we, can, we can contribute in that way, and every individual contribution helps. In Africa, certainly many, in terms of malnutrition, the lack of animal source foods in terms of milk or eggs or a little bit of meat is, is actually a major cause of malnutrition, and people could do with eating more meat. You know, uh, livestock in Africa, that tends to be kept more for the insurance value, for the investment value, that it's a way, you know, if, if you've got hyperinflation, your, your price of your cow actually goes up with inflation, whereas the money in the bank disappears. So it, livestock has a very, very different role. So um, in our table debates, uh, I don't know if you know Tara Garnett, but Tara Garnett is, is uh, she's written an awful lot about the, the meat debate, and she's vehemently, she's vegan and vehemently against meat production, and I have a much more nuanced approach to it. But in the Netherlands where we are, you know, we have, I mean, the Netherlands has become really a, a sump of manure, where we have uh, poultry production and pig production, which is landless. It's highly efficient if you measure input and output at the farm gate in and the farm gate out, because what goes in is soy and concentrate, what comes out is meat and manure of a, of a pig farm. But then that manure ends up staying in the Netherlands, and we've got this global disbalance, which is crazy. So, I mean, the Netherlands is in a real hard place now, and you see it with all of the tractors uh, on the Mali felt in the middle of Den Haag, you know, blocking, uh, blocking the, the city, blocking the motorways. We see these amazing protests. Farms in the UK seem rather quiet for some reason. Maybe it's because you left the EU. Uh, yeah. But I mean, I, I think livestock has definitely got an important place, certainly if we want, want to have nutrient cycles on farms. But it's the intensity, you know, we tend to push things beyond the limit of what's sensible so often. I think we've got time for three more questions. Can I have the lady there with the orange scarf first? Hello, thank you. So um, a lot of these um, roles of science that we talked about now, um, or roles of scientists in society 
um, make me wonder if what you think about the job description of a scientist in the future, because you basically say, oh, we maybe need to change the way we fund science, we maybe need to change the way we communicate science. Would you say there needs to be a bigger role of activism within scientists? Yeah, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> I, I, think, I think we all need basic courses at university in ethics and philosophy as a starting point, actually. Because I, I think it comes down at the bottom line. You know, I, I know I'm wrong on quite a number of things, and maybe I'm rather strongly opinionated about them as well. Um, but I think you've got to be prepared to change your mind as a scientist. But you've, you've, you've got to, I think you've got to be able, of course, I mean, OK, my, my definition of, of uh, university education always was sowing the seeds of confusion and distrust in people's minds. So it's basically about teaching people to think and to question, yeah, and to, to, to say, I won't accept that unless I see the evidence, yeah. So I, I think we've got to hold true, if you like, to a basic science ideal, you know, science is the pursuit of truth. And I think very often in the competitive world, people's own ambitions and careers come in the way of that. I think that's deeply disturbing. So, I mean, I think, in a sense, what I'm arguing for, I suppose, is for an ethical approach to science. But I wouldn't, you know, I think science goes everywhere from, you know, reductionism to constructivism and, and everything in between. And I think we need all of that. Uh, I work a lot these days with historians, actually. That's really interesting. Trying to track back why have things changed and when did they change, particularly in Africa. And we can learn an awful lot from things like that as well. Anyway. I'm rambling, sorry. Finally, Ray. Hi, Go Ken. I, I was quite shocked, actually, when you started talking about the potential devastating effects of the EU's food to farm to fork strategy. You know, because I've always thought in my EU-centric way, this is <clears throat> a reasonably good policy, you know, yeah. decreasing chemical inputs into agriculture and perhaps solving some of the Netherlands manure dump problem, for example. Sure. Um, so what do you suggest we do about that? What, what would you say to the EU chief scientific advisors on this point? Yeah, I mean, the problem is then, you, in a sense, you're putting a, you'll be put in a corner and said, we need the answer today. And that, that's a difficult one. I mean, scenario think is very, very useful around some of these, providing alternatives. If we think about the farm to fork strategy, you know, the, the, the declaration we're going to reduce uh, the use of pesticides by 50%. That's just plucked from the air without any thought of the alternative and, and, and the likely spillover effects. I think the fact that the environment is so high on the agenda for the EU is great. The EU still spends a third of its budget on the common agricultural policy. That money goes back to farmers to support them. And, and they're often supported to do things like have flower strips along their fields and, and the like. Now, you can question how useful that is for biodiversity. Yeah? Um, so I think the, the, the general movement that, that, yes, we've got much more attention to it is very good. But at the same day, it, if we were to reduce our consumption and, and minimize our, our footprint, then yes, OK. But we're not necessarily doing that. And these things have to go hand in hand. So I'm not against, to be honest, the Green Deal. I think that the Green Deal has a lot positive about it, but it's just we need to be aware. And that discussion of this broader, you know, the ecological footprint, it's really not, it's really not on the table for many people. So, and, you know, it's this is problem with scientists, isn't it? Oh yeah, we need to do more research. Um, but, but we need to engage with the evidence that's available and to present different alternatives and to think, well, what are the spillover effects going to be to, to other parts of the world? Because if by reducing our production here, that means that production goes to an area where it's done much less environmentally friendly, you know, we can have all that we want in terms of animal welfare in Europe. But if that just means that you've got uh, factory farming of poultry happening in South America or different parts of Africa, then we're, yeah, we're, we're shifting the problem, yeah? So it's really a plea for awareness. I don't have the answer, Ray, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, 
I'm really sorry, but I think we're going to have to stop there. Um, so many, um, several hands up in the audience. And uh, online, as I said, we've got over 150 people, and there's a stream of great questions. Okay. I would say to both people online and, and here that yeah. online there's great questions about things like regenerative agriculture and composting and wanting to justify your views on biostimulants. Okay. And I'll say to all these people, um, this seminar is being recorded. The link will be on the website, won't it, Naomi? We'll put it on the JIC YouTube channel, and so you'll be able to find the references to Ken's work there. Um, thank you for putting the references up in your slides, Ken. Um, this lecture is the Biffin Lecture. It's one of our annual um, named lectures, which we um, invite especially distinguished people to, such as yourself, Ken. Um, Biffin is best known in this institute as the um, founder of the Plant Breeding Institute in Cambridge, which is one of the progenitor institutes of the John Innes Center. Um, but Biffin was an agronomist before he um, became a geneticist and plant breeder. And he got into plant breeding because he recognized the importance of improved varieties mm. for agronomy, uh, as indeed you do. And I'm very delighted to present you with this um, beautiful picture. Ah. Oh, wow. Juggling too many things. Um, uh, a print from uh, the wife of a former director, um, Leonie Woolhouse, um, showing um, Biffin in his uh, famous floppy hat with enormous grains of, enormous ears of wheat. Um, so, Ken, um, let me put the mic down and present you this. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks for coming, thanks for listening, and uh, get, get active, get engaged, yeah. <laughs>